Okay, sweet. So, hi guys. Welcome to the last proper week of lower limb anatomy. This week we're going to go through leg, ankle, foot anatomy. Just like we've done every week. So, yeah, hopefully this won't be too torturous. So, we'll just start off with the bones. Um, we won't be going through like 3D landscapes and all that because it's really similar to the fibu, sorry, to the femur. So, we've got the tibia and the fibula of the leg and Honestly, I think it would just be best if you guys memorized all these uh, labels over here for the different landmarks and parts of the bone. Um, pretty similarly to all the other landmarks we've discussed, just remember the purpose of them and that'll make memorizing a lot easier, like condyles or articulation, tuberosities, and all the lines you see here are basically allowing different attachments of muscles or ligaments to these bones. We do have an interosseous membrane between the two bones, which is really similar to just like our radius and ulna. And that's just made of a fibrous connective tissue um, and its function is to like transfer loads between the two bones and basically separates different muscular compartments of the leg. So if you can remember what the three compartments are of the thigh, that's the anterior, the posterior and the lateral. Medial, medial. <laughs> in the leg, we have the anterior, um, posterior, and lateral uh, compartments. So slightly different there. Um, and as well, next to the bones, we have two of these joints, the tibiofibular joints, one up here and one down here. And it's pretty straightforward. Basically, there is an anterior inferior ligament on the end, at the inferior end, and a posterior superior ligament connecting the two at the top end. So just remember which one's posterior and which one's anterior and you're good to go. Okay, now for the foot bones. So bones of the feet, again, really, really similar to bones of your hand, basically. You have these tarsal bones and then the metatarsals, um, like the metacarpals and the carpal bones. And then from there, proximal, middle and distal phalanges, except there's no middle phalange on your big toe. So going to the tarsal bones, there's seven altogether in these red boxes. And just remember them as the four Qs, like the, the four Cs, the navicular and the two big boys back here. So we start off with these triplets. These are the medial, the intermediate, and the lateral cuneiform bone. Don't confuse intermediate and medial. Um, intermediate's in the middle here. And Lateral to that, we have the cuboid, shaped like a cube. So that's the four like cues, I guess. Um, and behind these, we have the navicular bone. Um, navicular basically means boat shaped. So it's kind of shaped like a boat, I guess. And behind that, we have a calcaneus, your heel, and your talus, your um, bony ankle over here. So yeah, that's it basically. And okay, we'll get to the joints later. So that's the bones of the foot. Tibiofibular joints, um, this is just a quick summary of the neurovasculature, but whatever artery and nerves, as we said last week, cross a joint, innervate the joint. So just remember that rule there. So, um, okay, now for the ankle joint. This is called the talocural joint, and it's a hinge type joint, um, as you can imagine your foot going up and down like this. Um, and what you need to remember is that on either side, there is a ligament complex. So on the medial or inside of your foot, you have a deltoid ligament. And that's comprised of four smaller ligaments that basically hold the tibia to um, the tarsal bones. And on the outside, the lateral um, foot, we have three different ligaments. The, basically, we have a ligament that holds the tibia to the fibula on, at the front and the back. We have something that holds the fibula to the talus and something that holds the fibula to the calcaneus. These are basically pretty straightforward because you just remember like the insertion and origin basically and that's what it is. Um, so it'll be good to remember those ligaments there. Um, so the nerves supplying them, tibial nerves, superficial fibula and deep fibula, we'll get into that later though. Um, and basically the neurovasculature is the malleolar branches. Um, you know your malleoli are like the two bumpy bits on either side of your um, ankle, if you can feel them, the lateral and medial malleolus. There's a basically a complex supply of anastomoses that happen there that create all the neurovasculature for the area that come from the anterior tibial and the posterior tibial artery, as well as the fibular artery. 
those are the three main arteries of the leg, but we'll again get into that in a, in a minute. Okay, and now for the ankle tendons. So this is, again, really similar to the upper limb, where instead of the carpal tunnel, we have a tarsal tunnel. And this tarsal tunnel is just a fibrous sheath around um, here and the contents, you can remember, this is pretty high yield, so I do remember this, is Tom, Dick and Very Nervous Harry. So we have three different ligaments, tendons, sorry, the tibialis posterior, the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus. Um, and we have NAV, the neurovasculature for the posterior tibial um, artery and vein and the tibial nerve. So if there's issues like um, compression over here, we can have issues with the tibial nerve acting up. It's all basically reflection of the hand, basically. You can get tarsal tunnel syndrome as well, so <laughs> that's pretty fun. Okay, subtalar joint. That just connects the talus to the calcaneus, not too high yield. But okay, let's move on to the muscles now. Um, okay. So the leg muscles are divided into three compartments, anterior, posterior, and lateral, not to be confused with the medial um, compartment in the thigh area. So again, please study your compartments, sorry, study your muscles by compartment because that makes anatomy so much easier. But basically the movement of the anterior compartment is dorsiflexion, like pointing your toes up and your foot up. Posterior does plantar flexion, and the lateral side does eversion. So basically just remember this by, honestly, I just remember this by doing it on my foot. Like if I flex my foot up and down, you can feel so, like your, the anterior compartment of your shin, of your leg area, just tensing up. Um, and eversion is basically limited to the lateral compartment. If you evert your foot now, you can feel like your little lateral muscles moving, I guess. Um, but the anterior and posterior compartment don't do eversion, they do inversion of the foot. Um, once again, the three major arteries of the leg, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and fibula. Uh, just remember this as like, well, fibula is the lateral bone, obviously, so it supplies the lateral compartment and the anterior tibial. I just think of it as like the bone's so big, so it needs like two different arteries for either side of it. That's apply the anterior and posterior compartment. And altogether, there are ooh, 13 muscles of the leg uh, separated into these compartments. And the posterior compartment is the only one that has two layers, a superficial and a deep layer. Um, you can remember this because, well, the posterior compartment of your leg, your calf is a lot bigger than the muscles you have like around your shin area. So basically the key to remembering any of these muscles, upper limb, lower limb, is to remember why it's called what it is. So remember the Latin, the hallucis means big toe. So if a muscle has hallucis in its name, like extensa hallucis longus, it means that the muscle goes all the way into the big toe and attaches to the um, metatarsals there. Digitorum is the same thing. It means the muscle goes all the way down and extends to the other toes, apart from the big toe. Longus means long, brevis means short. So it starts in the foot or starts somewhere down here, instead of coursing the entire length of the leg. Um, tertius means third, not the third metatarsal, but I think it's like, um, which muscle was it? One of, where's the tertius muscle? Yes, fibularis tertius starts in the lower third of the fibula. Um, and it goes down into the foot, so that's why it's called tertius. Fibularis means it originates somewhere in the fibula, and tibialis means it originates somewhere in the tibia. So just, remember the, so just remembering those simple rules will really help you understand why each muscle is named what it is. And it can help you with remembering origin insertion, which is kind of important for leg muscles, unfortunately. So, um, okay, now for the foot. Moving down to the foot, we have dorsal muscles, and we have plantar muscles, dorsal on the side facing up to the sky. So we have two different types of muscles, extrinsic and intrinsic. The extrinsic muscle we just covered, like all of these, they basically start from outside the foot and attach inside the foot. But the intrinsic muscles, they're smaller and they start inside the foot somewhere like these two guys over here. Because they're smaller, they're not as strong, they're not as wide, they do fine motor actions and they move the toes. Whereas extrinsic muscles, they're so big and fat, like, 
they do all the work from up the leg, so they dorsiflex, evert, etc. And altogether, there's just two intrinsic muscles, the extensor digitorum brevis and the extensor hallucis brevis. You can remember this because extensor is on the dorsal side of your foot. Just extend your foot right now, like point it to the ground, and you can feel the um, dorsal side of your leg moving, uh, tensing. Um, digitorum is all the other toes apart from the big toe, which is hallucis. We call it brevis because it's short. It originates somewhere in the foot instead of being a longus that originates somewhere like up at the top of the tibia or whatever. Okay, and now for the plantar side, so the bottom of your foot that touches the ground is the plantar side. And plantar is pretty uh, straightforward because it's just four layers and they're just literally one on top of each the other, like a four layered foot sandwich. So it's pretty easy to kind of imagine that 3D. But uh, yeah, once again, unfortunately you guys will just have to memorize this, but I really suggest that you draw out each layer color code it, whatever, and just label it because that'll really help you understand um, how they work with each other. But you can remember it as, I guess, the foot muscles on the bottom layer are the thickest and the biggest, but if you move higher up, um, they get smaller, more, more like specific, I guess, until they're literally just the interossei muscles in between the metatarsals here. Um, yeah, so the blue ones are the extrinsic muscles that have their um, tendons going down into here and attaching to different parts of the metatarsals here um, and the black are all the muscles that you guys can memorize in your own time. Um, yeah, some other cool images from Teach Me Anatomy. So just really quickly, just to reinforce your knowledge, let's go through the anterior and lateral leg muscles. So Anterior compartment, so we're here on the right, lower limb over here. The anterior compartment is composed of four muscles over here, and the lateral compartment only has two muscles um, on the very lateral side of the foot. So we have the fibularis longus and the fibularis brevis. Brevis is short, starts over here, fibularis longus originates up here at the top of the fibula. So the fibularis longus, because it is so long, its tendon actually keeps going and wraps around all the way to the first metatarsal. Whereas the fibularis brevis, because it is shorter, it just um, ends and attaches to the um, fifth metatarsal over here. So it will be good to remember that. Now moving over to the anterior compartment, uh, the big one over here, it's the tibialis anterior. Next we have the extensor hallucis longus muscle and the extensor digitorum longus muscle. As you can see, it's called digitorum, so it goes all the way into the digits and attaches to the very end of your toes at everything except for the first toe, which is the hallucis. Uh, it's longest because it starts all the way up, like in the upper limb, sorry, at the top of the leg over there, instead of somewhere down in the fibula or in the foot. And yeah, this is the guy I was talking about earlier, fibularis tertius, it starts lower down in the fibulas, in the fibula and attaches to the fifth metatarsal joint. So that's the four anterior and two lateral leg muscles. Now for the posterior leg, we have two layers, remember, deep and superficial. The deep layer is comprised of four muscles, as you can see here. First of all, the popliteus. It's within the popliteal fossa um, at the back of the knee, where we are right now. I think this might actually be one of the sides of the popliteal fossa, um, creating one of the borders of the popliteal fossa over here. Um, but yes, moving down, we have the flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus. Again, these are longus, so they start all the way up there and attach at the bottom to the different metatarsal on the plantar side of the foot. And we also have the tibialis posterior muscle, which is similar to the tibialis anterior on the other side of the calf. So those are the four deep muscles. And moving up, we have three superficial muscles. First of all, we have the gastrocnemius, which you know as your big calf muscle at the back of your leg. Uh, both of these should be highlighted, but basically there's a medial head and lateral head. Um, and as these end as a tendon over here, the calcaneal tendon, aka the Achilles tendon, and we also have the plantaris muscle over here. This muscle is tiny, some people don't even have it, 
And what it does is it basically supports the gastrocnemius when you get up on your toes or whatever. But I think it also has some cool proprioceptive, um, proprioceptive functions. Basically, it has a lot of stretch receptors inside. And it's pretty important because it basically like, tells the other calf muscles like where they are, what's happening. So without it, um, the gastrocnemius wouldn't really know where they are, what's happening. So think of it like that, I guess. Um, and last of all, we have the soleus. The soleus is right underneath the gastrocnemius. It's like the same thing, but a bit longer and a bit flatter. Just over here. I won't be going through foot muscles because they're very 2D, just like layer by layer. Um, but let's move on to the arterial supply. Okay, um, I think we're gonna go through this in 3D actually. But this is a good slide to just refer back to if you want to remember the different um, major vessels of which they are the anterior, posterior tibial and the fibular artery. Um, but yeah. I really like these diagrams because they're very simple uh, and simplicity is key. And I think you guys should start with memorizing something like this before you get into the branches. Um, so yeah, make some image occlusion on Anki. You'll get this in no time. And the foot. Okay, and let's go through the vasculature because it is a bit confusing, especially the foot. The foot is very confusing. So apologies in advance if I get something wrong as well. Um, but let, let, let's give it a go. So we'll start with the leg, pretty simple. We're doing veins because um, I've been doing arteries every other week. And arteries just follow veins, so let's do veins this week. Um, so yeah, remember, two types of veins, deep veins and superficial veins. Deep veins lie in the deep fascia of the leg, whereas superficial veins run in the subcutaneous tissue, um, living up to its name of superficial. Um, major deep vein over here is a popliteal vein which comes from the um, femoral vein up there and branching off of it is the small saphenous over here just uh, when it starts becoming the popliteal vein the small saphenous branches down and the great saphenous on the other hand starts all the way we're still on the right lower limb by the way um, up in the iliac area underneath the, the, the inguinal ligament and courses down all the way through here and supplies the medial leg, as we can see here. Uh, contrast that with the small saphenous vein, which is in charge of supplying the posterior leg, brain, I should say, posterior leg. And just a little note, this is just called a paratibial perforating vein. I just highlighted it because in the, in the veins, we're going to see there's a lot of uh, perforating veins which attach veins together. For example, as you can see here, well, let me show you. Yeah, like the anterior tibial vein actually splits into two and goes down as two anterior tibials with little ladder rungs, I guess, on each side. Um, so those are the perforating veins that we see more in veins than arteries. But yes, anterior tibial, just like the artery, is in charge of the anterior side of the leg. It comes down at the bottom of the popliteal vein. And as well as that, there is a posterior tibial vein, which goes down the posterior side, and the fibular vein, which branches off at the same time and basically hugs the fibula on the lateral leg as it goes down all the way to the ankle. But we'll get to the ankle later. So yeah, that's very clear. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, okay. So let's go to, oh, feet are confusing, but let's, let's go to feet now. So feel the foot as I said earlier. Um, let's start with the great side from the vein. So remember that this vein comes down from uh, the hip area and supplies everything medial. It continues basically in the foot as the medial marginal vein. We've got two marginal veins, one medial and one lateral on the other side over here. And basically the medial marginal vein, it's, it's a big one, just like the great saphenous vein is a major vein. So it drains something major, it drains the arches. We have a plantar venous arch and the dorsal venous arch over here and that's where the medial marginal vein uh, drains as well as the lateral marginal vein as we'll see in a second. So great saphenous continues medially down to the marginal vein. Um, okay now posterior tibial vein which branches off the popliteal goes down the posterior leg continues as the lateral plantar vein and the medial plantar vein. By the way I've removed all the metatarsals and the uh, 
and the minor branches, which is why it might look like it's missing something. But um, basically the medial plantar vein gives off a lot of branches to the toes as well. And the plantar venous arch is where a lot of metatarsal branches also come off over here. Um, so the plantar venous arch is a continuation of the lateral plantar vein. These all come from the posterior tibial veins and it drains up into the popliteal and so on and so forth. Now, flipping over to the very top of the right foot, we see the anterior tibial veins uh, going down the anterior tibia. And we also have the small saphenous vein continuing down laterally, very similar to the fibula. You can see that like um, the small saphenous here, it's, it, it has a greater distance from the fibula, whereas the fibula veins right here is like just hugging the fibula. So that's how you can remember that the saphenous is more of a, um, a superficial vein rather than the deep ones over here. But yeah, so small saphenous continues on as a lateral marginal, and this gives off the dorsal venous arch of the foot. And this arch gives off all the random metatarsal, phalangeal, whatever veins that drain the toes. Um, but just remember, each of the saphenous veins, the greater and the smaller, they each give off a marginal vein. From the marginal vein, they connect into different arches, a dorsal venous arch, um, plantar venous arch, and whatever. So that's the saphenous. Now, let's move on. I just had a lapse of memory. Did I already go through this? Yeah, I did, okay. <laughs> now the fibula veins. Um, the fibula veins, again, hugging the fibula, going down here, basically supplying part of the cacao caneus and um, anastomosing, uh, connecting, branching off and connecting to the anterior tibial vein over here. Okay, so hopefully that made sense. We're gonna quickly jump over to the arteries of the foot, kind of to reinforce these ideas, but also to introduce a few other um, branches and whatnot. Okay. So let's start with, sorry, let me just move something around. Okay. We'll start with the anterior tibial artery. Just like the anterior tibial vein, comes down here, continues as the dorsalis pedis down here, and it gives off the medial malleolar artery, which supplies the medial malleolus, um, and also forms a connection with the perforating branch of the fibular artery, which just comes off the fibular artery over here. So that's just a minor branch. Um, but what happens is that we have a lateral malleolar artery over here, just like the medial malleolar artery. Um, and this lateral malleolar artery, along, along with the fibular artery, does a whole lot of anastomoses and connections over here and forms the calcaneal branches over here, which supply your heel bone. Um, and over here, the lateral tarsal artery, which is a continuation of the dorsalis pedis down here, contributes to the lateral malleolar network over here, which supplies the lateral malleolus, which is the bumpy bone you feel on the outside of your ankle. Um, and these malleolar networks, they're all formed by anastomoses and they mostly supply the skin and subcutaneous tissue of the area around um, your ankle instead of very deep. I mean, there's not much deep muscle or fascia going on in the foot anyway, but that's what the malleolar network does. Um, spinning back around to the top, we see the dorsalis pedis artery. Now this is really short and it's just a continuation of the anterior tibial over here. But what happens is that it gives off a lot of branches. One minor one is the medial tarsal arteries over here, which um, basically supply the medial tarsal bones. And a big one it gives off is that the dorsalis pedis continues on as the arcuate artery. And the arcuate artery is just like, just like the, uh, the arches of the, like the venous arches. It gives off the metatarsal arteries. And you have it here. And then that gives off the dorsal digital arteries over here. There's two for each foot, uh, one on the medial and one on the lateral side, sorry, two for each toe, of each toe. Um, yeah. So basically, just remember, arcuate artery is the big guy that basically supplies the dorsum of the foot and the toes with all of its branches. <clears throat> okay, now moving back to the medial side of the foot. 
we have the medial plantar artery, and this comes off the posterior tibial artery over here, and this continues with a deep branch and a superficial branch, but the deep branch just goes straight ahead, pretty linear, pretty simple, and it gives off the more metatarsal arteries and the more plantar digital arteries. Um, so yeah, the dorsal digital arteries from the arcuate and the proper plantar digital arteries um, are from this artery here. And finally, just like we have the deep branch over here of the medial plantar artery, we have a superficial branch over here. And this is kind of like a three-pronged fork. It connects with some other uh, metatarsal arteries. And yeah, and the lateral plantar artery also comes off the posterior tibial artery back here, just before it becomes the deep branch. And this basically shoots around and becomes a deep plantar arch, kind of like what the arcuate artery looks like on the other side, again, giving off uh, branches that supply the metatarsals and the phalanges. Okay, so hopefully that made sense and wasn't too chaotic. So these are just some images that I like. You can look at it later. But finally, let's move to the clinical stuff. So we're nearly done, guys. There's like not too many clinicals. But um, a major one that you guys should remember is the ankle fracture. Basically, we classify it in three different types, Weber A, B, and C. And they're all basically created with a slightly different force on a slightly different inverted or everted foot. But its significance um, is that its whereabouts in the fibula, it's damaged. So Weber type A is only like the tiny neck of the fibula damaged. Um, type B, you move up the fibula, and type C is in the actual shaft of the fibula where we have damage. So remember that. Uh, okay, so Potts fracture. Potts fracture is basically like angle fracture, but way worse. And it's basically called a bimalleolar fracture where both your malleoli um, are damaged and broken. <clears throat> um, and so the three parts of it is that your lower fibula is fractured, so your ankle is already displaced, and then the medial malleolus is broken due to the, like, the eversion force. Yeah, it's really hard to demonstrate over Zoom, but you can imagine as like the foot turns outwards, the medial malleolus over here is like broken off. Um, and then the talus, which is the ankle bone, moves laterally like this way, like up there, and then that breaks the lateral malleolus. And then the tibia, because the malleoli are like all dead, it just is forced anteriorly, like towards us, and that shaves off, um, basically damages the talus itself. So try to imagine that. Um, and that's a Potts fracture, it's really bad. And sometimes a trimalleolar fracture happens where the posterior malleolus of the tibia the uh, like back here is also fractured as well so yeah pulse fracture um that's subtalar yeah okay let's go through this subtalar dislocation is basically tibia your uh, shin bone dislocating from your talus which is your ankle bone um causing a talar shift um and yeah basically it presents with the foot really inverted and it's usually caused by inversion by an inversion force when your foot is plantar flexed um yeah this is pretty rare though it's it's not too off, often you see this and it's open like often a huge open wound when you find it as well but talus fractures okay we want to talk about this because this is really similar to what happens in your hand um so in a talus fracture you can also get a vascular necrosis um, when basically there's too much dorsiflexion up, up, like of your foot, and basically the neck of the talus is pushed against the tibia bone. So the blood supply can be disturbed, and similarly to the scaphoid, the bone can die. This often happens when you're jumping from a height. Uh, not much can really cause the talus to fracture, basically. Um, and usually it happens in the neck area, which is right in the middle, which makes sense, like the middle has the greatest um, damage. Um, and the body and the head don't really get fractured so much. So you can see here, it's broken right through the head, sorry, right through the neck in the middle. 
Okay, calcaneal fractures, again, cause more fall from height, usually. <clears throat> um, yeah, pretty simple. It just becomes a comminuted fracture, usually, spreading into like a million different pieces. Not a million. Um, but yeah, perineal palsy and tarsal tunnel syndrome, these are pretty significant to remember. So perineal palsy is what causes foot drop, as you may have heard. Basically, the anterior compartment of the foot is paralyzed. And if you point your toes to the sky right now, you can remember that the anterior compartment is in charge for doing that. It's in charge for, um, yeah, for basically keeping your foot up. Um, so because of that, because these muscles are now damaged, because the nerve doesn't work anymore, the posterior muscles are the ones working and there's no force at the front to um, displace that. So the foot now is always kind of, oh, sorry, it's so hard to explain, but basically the foot always looks like this now instead of being on the flat ground because the anterior muscles aren't working. And this makes it hard for the patient when they walk because there's no way of turning their toes up. So when the patient walks, they have to flick their foot to the side, like when they <laughs> walk like this, so that um, the foot can actually move. I'm sorry if that didn't make sense. Um, but okay, tarsal tunnel syndrome, as we said before, basically in the tarsal tunnel, like the carpal tunnel, the tibial nerve gets compressed as it moves through, which can happen when there's inflammation, overuse, when something gets, when the calcaneal tendon gets too thick, um, and the area is just, is just tightened, basically. You can feel burning and tingling on the side of your foot, um, and often caused by fall, edema, anything that causes inflammation. And ankle sprain. So ankle sprain, mm, excuse me, is damage of the ligaments, whereas ankle strain is basically muscles getting strained. So, <clears throat> so basically, remember how we talked about the deltoid ligaments on one side and the talofibular, calcaneal, whatever, on the other side? Um, so if you can remember, the deltoid has four ligaments, whereas the lateral ankle only has three, and they're kind of more spread out and not as strong, basically. So lateral sprains are a lot more common, which is where you invert your foot. I'm sure we've all done it sometime. Um, but yeah, that's all you remember. If you, if you invert it, you damage the lateral. If you evert it, you damage the medial. Uh, yeah, cool. Achilles rupture. We might do this next week, actually, in clinical. So don't worry about that. Um, plus planus pes capus is just flat foot and higher arched foot. And this all depends on um, your, your sprain ligament, sorry, that connects your navicular, which is the boat bone, to the calcaneus, your heel bone, depending on how strong that is. Um, and that just determines the longitudinal arch of the foot. Uh, it's not really a big deal, it's just, something different between humans. Um, and now moving back up, we've got two final fractures, which is the tibia and the fibula fracture. Um, we already discussed how this can happen in uh, ankle fracture, and usually this does happen with ankle pathologies, because if just like in your upper limb, your bones here and your ankle is kind of like a ring. So if you break the ring, usually there's two fractures somewhere in the ring. So Often it's like fibula is broken along with the tibia or fibula is broken along with the ankle or something. Uh, yeah. And usually you don't do surgery. You just put it in the cast and let it heal itself. Uh, but for a tibia fracture, there's three different types. That's all to remember. In the shaft, in the, like, the tibial plateau, more distally, and uh, dis sorry, more proximally, and in the distal tibia, in the medial malleolus, usually. Um, yeah, I think that's all. There we go. Okay, so this is just going to be about the pain stuff. Hopefully this won't be too painful. Um, shouldn't take too long. So yeah, let's get into it. So basically, talking about pain, everything previously, we talked about um, the different kinds of sensation. Um, pain, once again, is a type of sensation, but this is special. So this is basically... Um, so nociception is basically a detection of your pain, so indication of um, a kind of injury or harm that's occurred to the body, and it serves as a protective mechanism um, against any kind of stimuli. Um, yep. So basically, 
these nociceptive fibers, they have these free nerve endings, which we can see in the next slide. Uh, where are we? Okay, so we can see here in this next slide, um, there's a bunch of free nerve endings. And the point of this is so it can get the sensory stimulation quite quickly. Um, this is just a bit of a general summary. So they respond at damaging levels and they also have a different kind of pathway that travels to the brain because you want to kind of keep that separate from all the other kinds of sensation. Um, and something to keep in mind as well, that you have damaged cells, which release these special kinds of substances. And these basically help sensitize your nociceptors. So if you're thinking of a chronic pathology, just know that um, it's very possible for them to like be more painful in a sense because of those damaged cells. In terms of how this relates clinically, so you can have like three types of neuropathic pain. So first you've got your dis dysesthesia. So that's just abnormal sensation. You've got your hyperalgesia and your allogenia. So as you can see here, you've got a normal pain response over here. Um, if you have an injury, this basically shifts the whole entire curve to the left. And what happens is a less intense stimulus will result in a greater pain intensity. So as you can see with the allodynia, um, normally you're, if you had a stimuli like around here, you wouldn't be feeling any kind of pain but already you're experiencing some kind of um, pain intensity. So that's something that um, is relevant clinically. In terms of the phases, you've got four main ones you need to do. By the way, there will be questions at the end, so kind of keep these in mind. Hint, hint. Um, so yeah, four main phases. So first, transduction phase. That's when you've got some kind of a sensory stimuli um, activating your nociceptors, so transdux. Second, transmits. So that's going through a bunch of neurons to your brain. So we've got three types of neurons. Um, think about it logically. So first one, it's going to go from, let's say, your hand, which has been placed on a hot plate, all the way to your spinal cord. And then second, it's going to go from your spinal cord to the thalamus, and that's where you perceive the pain. Third, you go from the thalamus to the sensory cortex, and that's where you localize the pain. Um, we'll talk a bit about the fibers a bit later on, but um, these are what they are. Third, we've got the modulation. So once you've experienced the pain, you want to do something about it. So this is where this comes in. So you've got a bunch of signals coming down to inhibit the pain. And fourth, you've got a perception phase, not really to do with these three, but basically that's just talking about when you are conscious that you are experiencing pain. So let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. So first one, instruction. Remember, this is going to be going from your receptors to the, oh no, sorry. This is basically when you are, um, getting an external stimuli and stimulating the receptors. So two things to kind of note. First of all, histamines, these are the substances that are going to activate your nociception. And once you can see, like it's released from mast cells. Second, we've got the icosanoids. And what they do, they potentiate or like maintain that particular kind of pain. So histamines are going to activate it. Icosanoids are going to keep that pain going. And Basically, they sensitize pain, right? So um, as you can kind of think, like I mentioned with the chronic pain, these are like the icosanoids are the chemicals that are going to be relating to that. Hence, it's going to make it easier for those receptors to activate. Hence, you are going to be like more sensitive to pain. So that was more um, about like general sensation. This is particularly relating to temperature. I don't think you guys will be assessed on it, um, but it did come up in a lecture. So here it is. Basically, you've got your um, hot and cold receptors. Just know that those are two different receptors. And once the temperature goes above or below a certain um, point, that's going to be when your nociceptors start firing. Um, the point is like normally your temperature, it's um, activated by, oh no, sorry, it activates a different kind of fiber. But once it's say like, the temperature exceeds something like 50 degrees, that's when your nociceptors are going to start firing because it's a harmful stimuli and it's going to destroy your tissues if your body doesn't do something about it. So next we're talking about transmission. So remember those are the fibers that are going from like the receptors all the way up into your brain. So the main fibers, you've got your A delta fibers and your C fibers. In terms of the different fibers, we can split them up into two types of pain. So you've got your fast pain, which is going to be short, very quick, well localized. And these are going to be transmitted by your A delta fibers. And if you think about it, they're really, really fast. So these are going to be your myelinated fibers. In contrast, you've got your slow pain, which is transmitted by your C fibers. Because it's slow, it's going to be unmyelinated. The two tracks that you can um, kind of keep in mind, neospinothalamic tract for your fast, 
paleospinal thalamic tract for your slow. Um, I did a bit of a quick Google. So like near just means like new. So this is like the new tract. Pelia is like the old-ish. So like the old tract. So if you think like new is like better in a way, it's like it's fast, it's new. That's just like a good way of remembering it. So next are just like a bunch of diagrams that kind of showcase this. So you've got your um, A delta and your C fibers. These are responsible for your pain. As you can see, the A delta one, that's going to be myelinated, not too, too much, but still is. C fibers meanwhile have no myelination. This is contrasted from what we were talking about, I think it was last week or a couple of weeks ago, um, from your A alpha and A beta fibers. So these are the ones that are responsible for like normal sensation. However, the different fibers, A delta and C fibers are going to be for pain. So something, um, yeah, do remember that because that is quite high yield. In terms of the ascending pathways, so you guys would have talked about this in semester one as well, but this is a bit of a revision. All of your pain, crude touch and temperature goes by your spinothalamic pathway. And the way it works, so you start off in the dorsal root axon and basically it decusates, decusates just means like moves to the other side, it decusates immediately. And you can think about this as like, it's a very, very urgent um, kind of stimuli. You really want to like, Get it straight to the brain so hence it's kind of decusating immediately travels straight up and then reaches the cerebral cortex um that's a bit different from the dorsal column medial lumniscus pathway which kind of just like travels up idly reaches a medulla and then it kind of decusates and then goes there so this is decusating at the point of the spinal cord so this is another diagram that showcases this so the one on the right um, as you can see, starting out um, from your nociceptors, decusating um, basically in the spinal cord, traveling up all the way until it synapses um, at the very end in the sensory cortex. So once again, another diagram showcasing the different kinds of fibers and what they're responsible for. So you can have a look at that in your own time. Okay, so we've talked about all the stuff that's going up. Now let's see what the body does in terms of modulating. So the way it modulates it is they send down pathways um, that essentially inhibit the ascending pathways. And that's basically um, modulated by something called an, in, um, an interneuron. So the whole entire process is outlined here, but it's probably easier to go through this. So what happens is you've got a bunch of, um, I guess, fibers coming in. So that's coming in from your hyper, I think that's from your thalamus. Um, yeah, from your cortex and your thalamus. There we go. So it's coming from the cortex and thalamus, and they're both going to basically um, converge at this point. That's called your periaqueductal break, and basically continue down all the way down until it gets to your um, spinal cord, essentially. So what happens there, if you have a look at this image, the green fibers, these are your ascending fibers. So these are going from um, I guess the spinal cord going up to the brain. And normally this would be carrying um, the signal that something's happening so that pain is happening essentially. Um, this is the descending pathway coming down from your periaqueductal grate. And what it does is it synapses on this interneuron. And this interneuron has a bunch of enkephalins. Enkephalins is just like a kind of signaling molecule. And as you can see on this zoomed in image, so kind of to orientate you guys, this is going to be um, the nociceptive impulse that's going to be carrying impulses to the brain. This is like the next axon. So this is the interneuron. Interneuron is acting on the ascending signal and basically releasing these enkephalons, which will bind on these receptors. And these receptors are basically going to inhibit these vesicles from binding. And that's going to prevent the signal from going up to your brain. Um, just a side note, these receptors, they are called your opiate receptors and opiate receptors, it kind of just means the receptors on the side of the axon as opposed to the receptors on like, or like the main receptors on the end of the axon. So always know that the opioid, recept uh, opioid receptors, sorry, these are always going to be inhibitory and hence if you have the interneuron um, basically releasing the enkephalons. Um, onto the opiate receptors, that's going to stop the ascending pathway of pain. So very quickly, we've got the pain perception. So somatic versus visceral pain. So somatic pain, this is going to be the pain that you can localize really well. Visceral, if you think about what viscera means, viscera is like 
organs kind of stuff. So like abdominal viscera, it's like all the organs in your abdomen. So somatic pain, it's usually re involving like receptors on the skin. And basically your body can tell like where the pain is very well. So it's very well localized. Visceral pain, it's involving your internal organs and stuff. And your body doesn't really know whereabouts it's coming from. So it's very poorly localized and usually will refer to some other place in the body, usually to a somatic structure, which is why, for example, if you have a heart attack, you'll often have pain radi oh, sorry, radiating down your arm. Um, and that's basically due to the fact that the heart is like a visceral organ in a sense, and it's referring pain onwards. So where can it, or like the area to which it refers to, there's a couple of different hypotheses or like theories as to like how this happens. So first you've got the common dermatome hypothesis, which basically says that if these two structures come from the same embryonic segment, then they're going to have the same innovation and hence pain is going to refer to those structures. Second, you've got your convergence hypothesis, which says that basically you've got two structures, they come via different nerves and these nerves kind of like come together. And because these two nerves come together and they go to the brain as one single nerve, these two structures will hence feel pain together. Third one is a bit of a if you want, it's called like a learned phenomenon, which is basically like your brain somehow like interprets it from some kind of previous trauma injury. It doesn't have a lot of ground to stand on compared to the, those two. So like these two are kind of the main ones to know. Um, last slide is basically talking about the gate control theory of pain. Would have covered this once again in semester one, but basically it just says if you have um, some pain coming in and you stimulate nearby areas and stimulate, uh, stimulate the receptors nearby, that's going to close the gate to painful inputs and hence you're going to experience less pain. So example here, you've got your C fiber, which is going to carry pain up, um, basically synapsing and then continuing on as a second order neuron. If you then stimulate um, some nearby receptor, for example, the mechanoreceptors in your skin, this is going to send signals up and going to basically um, promote your inhibitory interneuron to start releasing those encephalins, which is going to inhibit the second order neuron. Hence, you're going to get a weaker signal sent up to the thalamus. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too confusing. Um, we've got some questions in the chat. No, we don't. Okay, so um, basically I'll, I'll, I'll keep the chat open. So question time, let's see how much of that you guys remember. So which of the following activates your nociception? Nicrosinoids, acetylcholine, histamines, or interleukins? Oh, nice, really good job. Histamines, yep. So remember, icrosinoids potentiates the pain um, and histamines activate. So which of the following is not a phase of nociception? So transmission phase, transduction phase, moderation phase, perception, and modulation phase. Nice. Yep, that I just kind of made up. Um, which of the following two is that fibers? Yep. Which of the following two fibers conduct pain? So A alpha, A beta, A delta, and C fibers. Yep. So we've got a C D. Really good. So um, yeah, just remember A beta, that would be relating to kind of like normal sensory mechanoreceptors. So A delta is for fast pain and then C is for your slow pain. So what kind of fiber has no myelination? Kind of gave it away before, but oh well. Nice. Yep, so C fibers, these are going to be the non-myelinated ones. How do pain fibers travel up the spinothalamic tract? So do they decusate immediately at the dorsal root and travel contralaterally, decusate at the medulla, travel contralaterally, decusate at the thalamus, travel contralaterally, or do they not decusate and travel ipsilaterally? Yep, nice. So think very, very urgent pain, so decusating immediately. So what receptors do encephalins act upon? So GABA receptors, opiate receptors, muscarinic receptors, or histamine receptors. Yep, really good job. So opiate, it's kind of like the side door. Awesome, so I'll pass on to Malika. All right, that's better. Um, okay, so there's two types of arthritis. There's degenerative and inflammatory. 
So degenerative is pretty much osteoarthritis, which is mechanical. And then there's a bunch of ones under inflammatory. So the three I've highlighted are the three ones you need to know more in detail and the rest of them uh, pretty much you've just got to have heard of them. So in the inflammatory, you've got rheumatoid, which is an autoimmune condition, gout, which is basically an accumulation of uric acid crystals. There's reactive arthritis, so which is in reaction to an infection in the body. Septic, so infection from one part of the body spreads to the joint. SLE, so systemic lupus erythematosus. So that's an, another example of autoimmune. Psoriasis, so the patient ends up having red patches with silvery scales on their skin and ankylosing spondylitis. So you may have had a patient in one of your clinical institutes. I'm not sure if they did that this year and they would have talked to you about it. So that causes your vertebrae to fuse and that reduces the flexibility in the spine. Okay, so we'll go through osteo and rheum versus rheumatoid first. So osteoarthritis, like we said, is degenerative. So it's mechanical arthritis. So that focuses on wear and tear. So it mainly affects the weight bearing joints, like your knees and hips, and also your first metatarsophalangeal joint, your lumbar spine, and your cervical spine. For rheumatoid, we said it's inflammatory and an autoimmune condition. So that mainly affects your small joints in your hands and your feet. Arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis tends to be symmetrical. Osteo doesn't have to be because of that one's wear and tear. And rheumatoid also has inflammation, which causes cartilage and bone degradation. Okay, so this just kind of summarizes some of the points. So that's what a normal joint looks like on the left. And in the middle, you can see in osteo that the joint space is gone so that the bones are rubbing together, which causes the wear and tear. And there's thin cartilage because of that. In rheumatoid, you have the swollen inflamed synovial membrane. So all the inflammation and you've got some bone erosion as well. Okay, so onto risk factors. So the common risk factors are family history, obesity, being female. For osteo, advanced age is a risk factor, while for rheumatoid, 20 to 40 years of age is the most common age of onset. And then for osteo, you've also got trauma. And rheumatoid, you've also got smoking and environmental exposures, like asbestos or silica. So this is one of the, probably one of the more important parts for you to take notice of. So when you're asking your history for MSK, you ask about morning stiffness. And so if the stiffness lasts less than 30 minutes, that suggests osteo. If it lasts more than 30 minutes, that suggests rheumatoid. That's because with osteo, the pain is worse with movement. And so in the morning when you get up, you've been resting for a while, so the stiffness doesn't last that long. With the rheumatoid, the pain is better with movement. So once, like, once you get up and you start moving, then the stiffness starts to wear off. But in the morning, you've been resting all night, so that's when it's pretty bad. In osteo, joint instability can lead to loss of function. So you'll see that in the history as well. And in rheumatoid, it usually doesn't affect your DIP joint. So that's just a summary diagram. Okay, so clinical features. So for osteoarthritis, you get habitants and Bouchard's nodes. So habitants nodes are at your distal interphalangeal joints and Bouchard's are at your proximal. The other thing you get is difficulty in hand turning motions. So like if you're opening a jar or turning on a tap or something. For rheumatoid, there's a lot more signs to look for. So the joints might be inflamed, so hot or swollen or tender. And then there's a variety of different deformities. So you have the swan neck deformity, the boutonniere deformity. You can get ulnar deviation as well as the Z thumb deformity, claw, hammer, or mallet toe. Uh, you can also get carpal tunnel syndrome and rheumatoid nodules, which tend to be soft. For x-rays, they both have a loss of joint space. The osteoarthritis also has osteophytes. So like the Heber and Bouchard's nodes, you can see on x-ray and subchondral cysts, which is basically fluid filled space in your bones and sclerosis, which is um, abnormal hardening of body tissue. And in rheumatoid arthritis, you get erosion and soft tissue swelling and soft bones, so osteopenia. So all these pictures are for osteo. So as you can see, there's joint space narrowing over here. And you can see some of the subchondral cysts. So they're fluid filled cysts pretty much in the middle of the bone. And um, 
Okay, I'll show you in the next picture. You can see the sclerosis better here. So the picture to the left is osteo and the one on the right is rheumatoid. So sclerosis is just uh, hardening. So it looks more white on an x-ray and you can get other osteophytes. So that's basically extra bone formation. For rheumatoid here, you can see basically some of the deformities. So like you've got your ulnar deviation, you've got your swan neck deformity. And if you get the other ones, you should be able to see them too. You also have loss of joint space like in osteo and you can see some marginal erosions um, and some soft tissue swelling. Okay, onto gout. Okay, so gout is an inflammatory arthritis as well, like rheumatoid, and this is concerned with the buildup of uric acid crystals in your joints. So uric acid is a normal waste product. So that is formed when your body breaks down purines. So normally it dissolves in blood and it's processed by the kidneys and it leaves your body via urine. But if too much uric acid forms or your kidneys can't clear it all out, then you end up with hyperuricemia, which is basically too much uric acid in your bloodstream. So hyperuricemia doesn't always lead to gout, but it can. So it can lead to uric acid deposits in your joints, which are called tophi, And these are walled off to prevent interaction with the cells in the joints, aka to avoid inflammation. And so if it breaks out, it can cause an inflammatory reaction. So that can happen because of stress or trauma or an increase in uric acid concentration in the bloodstream. For example, if you change your diet, so there's a lot more purines, then that can cause that. And it commonly affects the big toe. So that's one major point that will always come up. Yep, so this is just summarizing it a bit. So inflamed joint, the swelling, there's uric acid crystals and deposits of uric acid. So risk factors, a high purine diet, so seafood, alcohol, turkey, uh, certain medications, family history, hypertension, obesity, diabetes, starvation or dehydration, and it most commonly affects middle-aged males. So clinical features, it's an acute onset and it commonly affects the big toe, like we said before. And because of the inflammation, there's severe pain, redness, and swelling. You also get loss of joint mobility. The tophi are basically mobile, firm, rubbery crystals that are surrounded by fluid. So in terms of lifestyle treatment, you can stop smoking and drinking alcohol. You can make sure you have weight control. Uh, avoid or have in moderation foods that are high in purine and then in the moment, you can rest, elevate, and put an ice pack on the affected joint. And that's it for arthritis. Okay, so um, we're doing farm next, and we're covering NSAIDs, SEDs, and DMARDs. So hopefully this won't take too long, but you know. So firstly, we'll talk about simple analgesics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So NSAIDs, their primary purpose is to stop cells making prostaglandins by the reversible inhibition of cyclooxygenase. And now you have two COX enzymes. So there's COX-1, and this is a constitutive enzyme in most cells. So it's kind of just there as a normal thing. It performs your sort of housekeeping tasks. So things like platelet aggregation. If you inhibit this enzyme, what happens is things like GIT ulcers, uh, renal toxicity, platelet dysfunction, you increase bleeding because you stop platelet aggregation and you also have airway constriction. On the other hand, COX-2 isn't a constitutive enzyme. It's induced in inflammatory cells when it's activated. And when you inhibit it, therefore, you're um, reducing that inflammation. What it does, however, as research shows, is it increases the risk of myocardial infarctions and cardiovascular events. Um, when you have a drug that's non-selective for COX-1 or COX-2, what you get is the sum of these two effects. You decrease gastric mucus but, and therefore increase the risk of peptic ulcers, increase bleeding and increase the risk of asthma. Um, and if you see in this diagram here, this is where NSAIDs act. They're blocking the COX-1 and 2 enzyme and hence the prostaglandin formation and everything downstream. So the key um, drugs that you would need to know is aspirin. That's a simple analgesic. It's anti-inflammatory and non-selective. Um, it's anti-thrombotic. And so that's how it affects the platelet aggregation. And hence it's used a lot as a preventative measure for people who might be at risk of say a heart attack. Um, you treat an aspirin overdose. This might come up in exam with activated charcoal, acid-based correction, dialysis, and support, 
bicarbonate to reduce the acidic state and the, hence increase the drug ionization so that more is um, excreted. Ibuprofen is a simple analgesic, it's um, anti-inflammatory, it's also non-selective. Uh, your adverse effects are what you would expect as usual from any COX enzyme inhibitor. Diclofenac will come to this more, but it's non-selective. It's used particularly for rheumatoid arthritis and for chronic pain with inflammation. Uh, meloxicam here is kind of the one that you need to remember just as being more COX-2 selective. So you have that reduction in GI toxicity. For example, for a patient with a peptic ulcer, you might use this. But the adverse effect is that you increase the risk of cardiovascular events, of MI of stroke. Uh, yep. Now, paracetamol, um, you've probably heard of this, but it's a simple analgesic, but it's not an NSAID. So it doesn't have anti-inflammatory properties, but it is antipyretic and an analgesic. The mechanism of action of paracetamol is unclear. It's mostly central, but honestly, we're not too sure. We do know it's better for the GI than aspirin. So again, for example, someone with, say, a peptic ulcer, you'd Preferably give them paracetamol because it won't increase that risk of um, stomach ulceration as aspirin would because it's blocking the COX-1 enzyme. Now, in a paracetamol overdose, the minor metabolite of paracetamol is NAPQI. Now, this is highly reactive. It binds to the liver and starts destroying liver tissue. And normally, it's conjugated to glutathione, I can't pronounce that, which is excreted but this is saturable. So the antidote for this is a precursor, so N-acetylcysteine. And if you inject that, then you can encourage more glutathione to be formed and hence excrete the excess um, NAPQI. Moving on to steroidal anti-inflammatories. These are your SEDs, they act higher up. So, where's Dagger? Whereas before we're blocking, oh no, we're blocking cyclooxygenase, now we're blocking higher up. And so steroids are hormones synthesized within your adrenal glands of the kidney. Glucocorticoids have both anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressive properties. So you can have your endogenous, which are produced inside your body, and they also possess mineral corticoid activity. And then you have your exogenous, which lack mineral corticoid activity and thus are less likely to produce adverse effects related with hydrocortisone or cortisone. Now, adverse effects will go into a bit. Um, there are quite a few adverse effects, especially with long-term use. So you want to be using and prescribing steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs with care. They're usually indicated for things like adrenal insufficiency, um, for inflammatory conditions, rheumatoid arthritis, and some allergic diseases. So the mechanism of action, so glutocorticoids bind to a cytosolic receptor and this receptor ligand complex translocates into the nucleus and it binds to a promoter sequence of inflammatory genes and has its effects there, things such as decreasing vasodilation, increasing leukocyte activity, histamine release, eicosanoid cytokine production. Um, I think the main thing to remember here is that it binds to a cytosolic receptor. So the core drugs that you should know are prednisolone. And so this is usually oral prednisone, which is then converted in the liver. It's exogenous, so no mineral corticoid activity. Dexamethasone is quite strong. It's exogenous as well and long acting. And fluticasone is inhaled and that decreases the inflammatory response. It's used as a preventer in asthma it has delayed action. So it reduces the secretion and swelling, which are associated with inflammation, but has no impact on the muscles. Um, because it's inhaled, the adverse effects are kind of isolated to where its effects are. So mostly sore throat, dysphonia, possibly um, oral candidiasis, a bacterial infection or any sort of infection because you're reducing the Inflammation, inflammatory response there. Um, now, in general, there are quite a lot of side effects of um, glucocorticoids, especially from long-term use. This is a general summary diagram. I think the main things to 
um, kind of keep in mind are uh, cardiovascular hypertension, um, possibly diabetes because you're increasing your blood sugar levels, cholesterol, triglyceride levels. You can also develop osteoporosis because you're suppressing the body's ability to absorb calcium. Um, the most common cause of Cushing syndrome is the use of corticosteroid medication, such as prednisone, in high doses for a long time. And so there's a lot of buzzwords when it comes to Cushing syndrome, um, particularly when you have the fat distribution around the abdominal area, but thin arms and legs. You have your moon face with your red cheeks. There's your buffalo hump, um, abdominal strii, and poor wound healing because of the lack of inflammatory response. So if you see any of those, then it is very likely that um, the patient has Cushing syndrome. So just think about kind of those buzzwords that come up in um, exam questions. Um, moving on, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, DMARD. So these are the ones that are for rheumatoid arthritis. So um, firstly, let's talk about NSAIDs and glucocorticoids. Now, NSAIDs you might use for a patient with rheumatoid arthritis because it does control inflammation and pain, it reduces swelling, it's cheap, and can improve the quality of life fairly easily. The problem is it doesn't actually affect the disease progression. It also causes GI toxicity, renal complications, hepatic dysfunction, BV complications, which might be problematic, especially in your elderly patient. On the other hand, glucocorticosteroids, so they're plus, they're anti-inflammatory, they're immunosuppressive, um, they can be used to bridge the gap between DMARD therapy and how long it takes to onset, which we'll talk about in a bit. And you can also inject it directly for individual joints. The con, again, disease progression isn't affected. And as we talked about, weaning off use is often unsuccessful and it can also cause adverse effects such as skin thinning, crushing, and steroid induced osteopenia, which is again problematic, especially for your elderly patients. So disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, um, these can actually control the disease activity, alleviate pain and maintain the function while slowing the damage. So it's actually affecting the disease progression itself rather than just the symptoms. The issue is they do take a while to become effective. So some take six to eight weeks and some can take up to six months to become effective. So this is where glucocorticoids might come in as a bridging therapy. The main ones to remember, I folded. So these four, um, Definitely remember these, and all you need to know is pretty much what I've put here. So methotrexate is a dihydrofolate reductase inhibitor. It upsets the liver. Leflamide, pyrimidine synthesis inhibitor, upsets the liver. Cyclosporin doesn't affect DNA. Instead, it's decreasing T cell activity. So remember this as the kind of oddball, whereas the other three are affecting DNA synthesis. This is affecting T cell activity, and also this one does not upset the liver. As if the prime Again, purine analog DNA synthesis, as I was saying, it also affects um, DNA synthesis and upsets the liver. Um, the other three are mentioned, but they're kind of either less well understood or just not as significant for the sake of MED 1200. Now, gout drugs. So, as Malika talked about, gout is caused by uric acid. So, what you want to do is firstly, um, remove any triggers and you can treat the pain with NSAIDs, glucocorticoids and colchicine. Colchicine, colchicine, okay, never mind. Allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. It decreases uric acid production. So you have less uric acid production, which is like the key driver of this disease. So it's very key therapy. The next one blocks tubular reabsorption of uric acid. So tubular reabsorption, in the kidney, so instead of reabsorbing it into the body, you're now excreting more of it. So more is coming out when you, uh, say, urinate. And that's getting rid of more of it. And finally, colchicine, I don't know how to say that, inhibits the migration of leukocytes into the joint. So because here you have sinusitis, there's lots of inflammation, there's too many white blood cells. If you can inhibit the migration of these white blood cells into the joints, then you're assisting with the gout symptoms overall. I would definitely remember all three of this and think and remember kind of their general mechanisms of action and how they're affecting gout and how they're reducing the um, disease. 
So a couple of questions, they're not too hard. Um, I'm planning to put up a quiz later, so only a couple questions here. Um, type in the chat. I can't actually see the chat, so I'm just going to go and say that yes, it's Cyclos Forum. Um, so yeah, remember the other three affect DNA and synthesis, and they also have liver, um, they also possibly upset the liver, whereas cyclosporin doesn't, so we'll keep that in mind. Geraldine has gout, which drug would decrease the production of uric acid to alleviate her disease? This is very much just remembering and being able to eliminate which ones you know are definitely not related. Yep, allopurinol, and it acts here, and it stops the conversion of xanthine to uric acid. So yeah, I'll put up more questions later, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, we'll stick around for a bit, but otherwise, I hope you all have a good day.